you're getting at a little bit what, what Rami referred to earlier as the clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, mm -hmm. people who have these clonal abnormalities and may not have overt blood abnormalities or mm -hmm. something that needs to be acted upon immediately. I think we're learning more and more about this and what I've heard from some pathologists is that they are geared up to make a diagnosis of MDS even in the absence of dysplasia if there are enough of these molecular abnormalities that have been detected that are consistent with a diagnosis of MDS. I don't know if, if, if uh, how others feel about I, that. I, I would have a problem with that and I'll be perfectly honest with you because I do think that it's very important to uh, include mutational analysis in certain diagnoses, but when it comes to MDS, the only one that I'll probably uh, think it to be specific is the SF3B1. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is in 80% of patients who have refractory anemia during sideroblast, mm -hmm. fine, but, but even then, you should be able to see it in sideroblast, which is the pathognomonic feature of this specific entity. So, but aside from that, um, you, and I know we're gonna be talking a lot about this later, but what about people who have perfectly normal blood counts and they have DNA T methyltransferase a mutation? So does that make them as people who have MDS? I mean, I think nowadays the MDS diagnosis is strictly linked to the identification of dysplasia. The problem is that the identification of dysplasia varies from one observer to the next. And f to your point, often you may have to do another bone marrow so that the pathologist will appreciate the dysplasia at that time. So, and that's in the absence of cytogenetic or BLAST. So, leads you to believe that the diagnosis of low-risk MDS is actually where the problem lies. Because if you have mm -hmm. BLAST, cytogenetic abnormalities, then I think it's relatively much easier to make a diagnosis. That's one challenge. The other challenge is actually in us hematologists seeing actually those patients that have cytopenias. And for the primary care physician to actually send you that patient for evaluation, often there's some degree of either age bias or perhaps multiple comorbidity bias. And well, they have those many illnesses. It's natural or okay or acceptable for them to have cytopenias. I'm not sure I would agree with that. So that's my take on diagnosis. I, I see that a lot too, that you know, patients are often referred relatively re late. Mm -hmm. That if they have heart failure or they have a little renal insufficiency, that the primary care doctor is not actually sending them for analysis. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times the, the anemia is contributing to their other comorbidities. So it's really, uh, I think, a, a real challenge for us to communicate to the primary care physician when it's appropriate to refer a patient for myelodysplastic mm -hmm. syndrome evaluation. But let's look at it from the other side. So obviously, like as you mentioned, there are patients that are not cytopenic at all that will have a clonal hematopoiesis maybe of aging. But those tend to happen in very low clonal burden frequency. So the variant allele frequency for those patients, like if they have a TET2, is going to be a 5 or 10 percent. So, so those are probably different a little bit. But if you have a patient who's cytopenic and you have some of the characteristics mutations and you are just lacking the dysplasia, currently we put those patients at, as clonal cytopenia of unknown significance. I think we have to learn a little bit more about that group and how they behave because they could end, because the cutoff now between those two groups is just presence of some dysplasia, which we all kind of discussed that's sometimes very difficult to you know, find and it's, it depends on the hematopathologist experience. So, so I think there will be a role for the mutations down the road. Like if you have somebody like in CMML now, we know that there are certain patterns of mutations like a TET2, SRSF2 mutation in the setting of monocytosis with a, you know, a variant in frequency of you know, not just the 5 or 10%. It's probably CMML. Uh, we just need some time to learn about those patients. When do they declare themselves? But I think down the road, we are going to be using them for you know, diagnostic criteria. So, so if I could take the liberty of trying to sum up what we've just said. Um, an anemia or other cytopenias are not just a normal consequence of aging, and these people should be referred to a hematologist for a bone marrow biopsy and determination of whether or not they have MDS. At the same time, detection of an isolated molecular abnormality in the setting of no cytopenias or a mild cytopenia doesn't make an MDS diagnosis. Mm -hmm. However, in the right clinical setting, and as you mentioned, spliceosome mutations or other molecular abnormalities with persistent monocytosis and cytopenias may get you close enough that you're more comfortable making that MDS diagnosis. Are there any blood tests you send on patients referred to you, what I call the I don't want to be an idiot test, to rule out mimics of MDS? Right. 
Yeah, I think that's a great question. So for a while we were doing even as a reflex, we checked LGL, PNH profile on almost every patient, at least the lower risk where the blasts are not increased. And then obviously the simple things, you know, like we sometimes forget, but vitamin B12 deficiency, mm -hmm. like I've seen cases where sometimes even the megaloblastoid changes were called AML and all the thing was B12. So I think we always have to think common of the common. So you always have to make sure that we really ruled all the nutritional deficiencies. Uh, like there are cases of LGL that could present like MDS, uh, less likely PNH. I'm not sure about you know testing in every single patient unless there is hemolysis. Uh, I think sometimes you know copper deficiency could be a great mimic for MDS, and in the right setting, one could think of of that as well. I think looking at medications is also very important. Mm -hmm. That many, um, especially older patients who tend to be diagnosed with myelodysplastic syndrome, have multiple specialists or multiple doctors they're going to, giving them multiple medications. And someone might not be sitting down with them and looking to see exactly what they're taking. And many medications actually can cause cytopenias. So I think it's very important, particularly in elderly patients, that you spend some time looking at their medications because many times we find that maybe uh, a new medication that was introduced to their regimen uh, is, is influencing their blood counts. I'll add to that list of viral infections, hepatitis mm -hmm. and HIV infections can certainly cause dysplasia. Remember the epidemic of um, MDS and HIV patients, mm -hmm. so it didn't pan out to be, but those are all dysplastic changes induced by infection or autoimmunity for that matter. Mm -hmm. Also, I will add the age group in whom uh, STDs are increasing with the greatest frequency are those in their 70s and 80s, those <laughs> nursing home residents, so can't eliminate HIV just because of age.